I think when we talk about institutionalized Islamophobia, um, to me, Guantanamo Bay is one of the most egregious manifestations of institutionalized Islamophobia. At its height, holding 779 exclusively Muslim male prisoners, and to this day operating with 41 prisoners remaining. Under Trump, we can only expect that their detention will be prolonged and whether or not they'll be free in the foreseeable future remains unknown. But let me start with a couple of quotes. So the first quote was by former President Bush who said, our war is not against Islam or against faith practiced by the Muslim people. Our war is a war against evil. Then President Obama in 2015 said, no one in the United States of America should ever be targeted because of who they are, what they look like, or how they worship. And then earlier this year, Trump said, Islam hates us. Now, there seems to be sort of a stark difference, right, in terms of the language that was used by both President Obama and President Bush, in contrast to President Trump. But the fact remains that the war on terror is a set of policies, not starting with President Trump, but stemming from 2001 after the World Trade Center attacks. So when we think about institutionalized Islamophobia, it's important that we go back to when these policies started. Because what President Trump has been able to do in terms of implementing the immigration ban, Muslim ban 1.0, 2.0, he's been able to do that because he's building off of a legacy of 16 years of problematic policies targeting Muslims. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with what that terrain looks like, there was, for example, the authorization for the use of military force in which the United States could basically treat the whole world as a battlefield. And keep in mind, this excludes the recent Syria strikes. The original um, description of the Muslim registry, otherwise known as the National Special Entry Exit Registration System, material support for terrorism laws, which have, as many of you know, deeply criminalized the Muslim community, controlled application review and resolution program, essentially barring Muslims from obtaining citizenship at multiple points throughout the immigration process, The NYPD's Muslim mapping program involving a vast operation of surveillance, extrajudicial killings, such as that of Anwar al-Awlaki, who was an American citizen, torture, as we've seen in Guantanamo Bay, CIA black sites and Bagram, and FBI surveillance. And those are just a couple of the laws and policies that have been implemented post 9-11. So again, when we think about institutionalized Islamophobia, we need to realize that they've been in operation, these policies and laws, for many years now. And several of the speakers touched on this, but I think it's important to reiterate over and over again. And another reason why I bring this up is, as someone who's been quite active around the war on terror, around Muslim and civil and human rights, when the Muslim ban came out, there was a lot of energy and momentum from the Muslim community around challenging these particular policies. Now, interestingly enough, it seemed to be, for some people, the first instance of a policy that was targeting Muslims. So it was interesting to observe that this was the first time, right, the Muslims had some recognition of this fact. But again, realizing that this stems way back further and understanding what that means for the position we're in today. So there was a report in 2014 from the Senate Intelligence Committee report Um, on torture by the CIA, and I want to read some of the findings of the report because, again, this to me represents one of the most egregious manifestations of the war on terror. So this is what the prisoners that were held by the CIA, some of the things they were subjected to. Rectal feeding was used to control prisoners, and I apologize, some of this is a bit graphic, but it's important to know. The CIA put hummus, nuts, and raisins into a detainee's rectum. A prisoner froze to death while chained to a concrete floor without pants. Prisoners were forced to stand in stress positions on broken feet and a prosthetic leg. Another prisoner had his eye removed. Interrogators brought high-value suspects close to drowning. CIA interrogators threatened to sexually assault a prisoner's mother. And there was the use of forceful rectal exams, which caused serious injuries. 
Now, who are these CIA suspects? These CIA suspects are Muslims, Muslim suspects held in the war on terror, Muslims who have been criminalized and demonized in such a way that this sort of treatment becomes legitimate and justified. After the report was released, there was a Washington Post slash ABC News poll in which the participants of the survey were asked, do you personally think the CIA treatment of suspected terrorists amounted to torture or not? 49% said yes, 38% said no. Subsequently, the question was asked, all in all, do you think the CIA's treatment of suspected terrorists was justified or unjustified? 59% said it was justified. So imagine, after hearing what these prisoners had gone through, that over 50% of those surveyed thought the torture was justified. Not just that, think about the language that was used. The question wasn't about whether it was humane, whether it was ethical, whether it was legal. The question was about whether it was justified or not. In other words, Muslim lives are only important insofar as they provide us with some sort of security value. So the Muslim life is securitized. And we have to think about that because it's that particular framework that is involved in the inception, creation, implementation of laws and policies targeting Muslims. Now, what I'm referring to, or what I'm speaking to, is state policy, right, and state violence. So what's important to think about in terms of state violence is the conditions it creates or the cues that it sends to the society. In other words, when society sees the way that the government is treating a particular target group, it sends the message to society that it is okay to target this group in the same way that they are being targeted by the government. There is a connection, a very solid connection. So when the government is consistently criminalizing, demonizing, torturing, detaining Muslims, it sends the message to society that it is okay to engage in things like hate crimes. So for example, in 2001, the number of hate crimes, the number of incidences of hate crimes was 481. Five years prior, the numbers were in the late 20s and early 30s. Thereafter, and until 2014, which is where the data has been collected up until, the number has never gone below 100. And we can only imagine that these numbers will increase as we get more data under the Trump administration. So needless to say, again, that there is a deep connection between the ways in which the state and state violence targets Muslims, and then subsequently how society responds to treatment of that group. When we think about Islamophobia as a system of oppression, we can think about it in three ways. There's interpersonal Islamophobia, institutional Islamophobia, and internalized Islamophobia. Now the panel here, um, the goal of the panel here is to talk about institutionalized Islamophobia. So most of my uh, future remarks will be directed at uh, institutionalized Islamophobia. However, I also want to address internalized Islamophobia because it is internalized Islamophobia that allows for institutional Islamophobia to continue. And something I think that is often missing when we talk about Islamophobia, given the fact that there are numerous definitions of what it means, what we're trying to articulate, what this phenomenon describes is sort of a shared understanding of the term Islamophobia. Some people use Islamophobia, some people use anti-Muslim racism, but what is it that we're trying to get at? So I want to read to you a definition of Islamophobia that I have come up with that I think articulates some of the nuances in terms of what we're trying to say has happened to the treatment of Muslims. So Islamophobia is a phenomenon meant to articulate contrived hate of Muslims that is built into structures of the state and society for the pursuit of power and the justification of war and repression. 
Islamophobia is based on the social construction of Islam as violent, barbaric, uncivilized, and opposed to normative democratic values, and exists as a system of dehumanization which results in consequences ranging from prejudice, discrimination, detention, and even death. Intersectional identities of Muslims along various ethnic, racial, cultural, and linguistic lines makes the source of Islamophobia difficult to distinctly isolate. However, Islamophobia represents a particular type of oppression as it operates at the nexus of anti-religious animus and racism, cultural racism, nationalism, and xenophobia. Islamophobia is maintained and perpetuated by white supremacy, which upholds notions of dichotomous ideological values between the West and Islam. So that's a quite um, extensive and very long definition, so thank you for bearing with me on that. Um, but I do think, you know, as we come to terms with dealing with the treatment of Muslims and addressing it in a multifaceted way, it's important for us to understand what it is that we're addressing and who it is that's being impacted. In some of these discussions, we often ex exclude black Muslims. Black Muslims are often doubly targeted being at the nexus of anti-blackness and Islamophobia. So what does that mean in terms of the interventions that we suggest or we provide? So what exactly then does institutional or institutionalized Islamophobia mean? This is a very important concept worth articulating. So in my research and analysis, how I interpret institutionalized Islamophobia is that it's this concept of the social construction of Muslims as barbaric, as uncivilized, opposed to normative democratic values, et cetera, et cetera, that's deeply embedded into the design and implementation of policies. Now, the government doesn't often make it easy for us and write into bills and legislations and laws and policies, specifically who is meant to be targeted, but we can then see it when it's implemented right? In the case of the immigration bans, it was, it was quite clear who the target of the policies were meant to be, and that was Muslims. However, in the language, there wasn't, the language was not about targeting Muslims, it was about targeting specific countries. So in that way, they attempted to be a little bit more vague. However, nonetheless, we still know who the target is. So I think that we have to think about institutionalized Islamophobia in a very concrete and measurable way. Because when it comes to material support for terrorism laws, for example, most of the individuals and organizations who have been targeted have been Muslim, right? So essentially, institutionalized Islamophobia is about creating a differential system of justice. And the importance of thinking about what Muslims have undergone throughout the course of the war on terror is to frame it in these terms. Because when we don't frame it as something that's institutional or institutionalized, then it becomes more difficult to dismantle because it then appears to be a series of disconnected policies rather than a system. So it's important that we continue to emphasize and utilize this framing. Now, I wanna transition quickly to the concept of internalized oppression and internalized Islamophobia. And one of the things that comes to my mind at this particular moment in time is that yesterday, for example, um, there was a massive bombing in Afghanistan. Has anyone here not heard the news about Afghanistan being bombed? Okay. So everyone here has heard that Afghanistan was bombed by a bomb referred to as the mother of all bombs. We have yet to know how many civilian casualties there are from this bombing, and we probably likely will never know. And it just reiterates the fact that Muslim lives are meaningless and devalued. Now, when it comes to incidences in which Muslims are the perpetrators, much of the Muslim community are quick to respond to condemn the actions of the Muslim perpetrators. On the flip side, when it is Muslims who are victimized, the Muslim response is often not there, invisible, 
silent, not asking for accountability. So for example, when the Senate Intelligence Committee report on torture was released, some of the responses asked for accountability, but made no mention of the victims. Whereas, when the victims are non-Muslims, we make sure to emphasize the value of their lives. Now, there are very obvious reasons, and uh, there's things we can speculate as to why this has been the response, the political climate, um, the context in which we're operating, et cetera, et cetera. However, it's important to think about the extent to which we ourselves have internalized Islamophobia, and how do we respond? So why hasn't there been a response to the bombing of Afghanistan? Now, part of that is because in many circles, or in the war on terror more generally, we're sort of taught to think that the domestic and international foci of the war on terror are very distinct and separate, when that's almost impossible to really conceptualize. What happens there inevitably impacts what happens here. When prisoners in Guantanamo are tortured, mistreated, and abused, that sets the limits of the type of abuse we can expect to experience on the domestic front. So it's unfortunate, and I think it's quite fallacious for us to think that what happens again internationally has no repercussions and should have no bearing in the way that we're responding to Islamophobia in the course of the war on terror. So when I've considered some of the responses from the Muslim community in terms of acts perpetrated by Muslim, violent acts perpetrated by Muslims, we often reiterate the notion of collective responsibility. Why is it that we're speaking out against the violence perpetrated by a fellow Muslim? If not for collective responsibility, then what is it? Not only that, when we describe an act of violence committed by a Muslim, we describe it in terms that they're barbaric, they're uncivilized, language along those lines. However, when we're talking about state violence, when we're talking about the United States literally dropping a bomb that decimates human bodies, there's not a word uttered. And if there is, the language would be much more benign. So when we're thinking about strategies and interventions to challenge Islamophobia, it shouldn't just be about challenging it in our societies, challenging it as it appears and is manifested by the state, but also as it appears within our own communities. Because in order to dismantle the system of depression, we have to decolonize our minds. We have to think about the ways, again, that we've internalized this discourse. The only way we can truly rise up and challenge institutionalized Islamophobia is if we truly, if all of us, are free from the internalized Islamophobia ourselves. So I will end with that. Thank you.